Before I jump into sort of the raison d'etre for being here, I want to give a little bit of background on my own background because I came here in kind of a nonlinear fashion. Uh, my background was I grew up in New York City. Uh, everyone here has heard of my father. He died when I was four. I did not know him. I did not fully understand his legacy. It was only in later years in my education, both uh, through reading and, and studying uh, both his legacy and the world he came from, that I got to really analyze and think about Poland, his place in it, his place as an iconic figure and an anti-communist dissident. And I didn't come to Poland until 2010, uh, one week before Smolensk. It was the first time I'd ever stepped foot in Poland. I was decently well-traveled, but I was always a little bit fearful of going to Poland because I knew the legacy and I knew the complexity of the history, his history, my family legacy, Polish Jews, most of whom were exterminated during the Holocaust. Uh, his own story was obviously iconic even before an anti as an anti-communist dissident, but also as a uh, survivor during the war, uh, passing himself off as a Frenchman, as a waiter in Frankfurt, speaking fluent French, as a Jew in the hotel where most Nazi officials had lunch and dinner. His theory was it was better to be in the eye of the hurricane than in the path of its destruction. And he wrote a great novel about this, Philip. Hopefully we will bring this to the big screen in coming years because it really is a cinematic tale. My own life leading up to my visit to Poland was uh, very, very uh, different than one would expect given the things I've engaged in. It was not political. I uh, grew up in New York City public schools. I survived that somehow. Uh, and even there, I was beginning to have these political debates because the New York City public school system, as most public school systems, is very far left. It is a factory of indoctrination toward more government, more statism, socialism, uh, and even, on occasion, overt Marxism. Uh, so I was always having a battle, and growing up, I had my grades docked many times for my political uh, debates with teachers and professors. Uh, I grew up in New York City. Uh, my family had moved uh, to New York after my father died when I was four. My father had moved to Rockford, Illinois. Rockford is a city about 70 miles outside Chicago. Fortune magazine used to do a survey on the 310 cities in America, and every year it came in 310th best place to live in America. It was a horrible place. He started a conservative think tank there called the Rockford Institute, and my mother, of course, was not happy being in Rockford, and after his, after his death in 1985, uh, we moved to New York, which is where she was from. And that informed really who I became more than anything else, New York being this uh, other modern day Rome, along with London, uh, a, a center of culture and, and intellectual activity and media and mostly finance. And I gravitated toward economics and the financial markets, and after attending University of Chicago, I went to Wall Street and worked for a few hedge funds uh, as a fundamental analyst, trader, and portfolio manager, which also informed my political views on the role of the markets and free transactions, free exchange in the human condition. In 2010, after creating a Facebook page, I started getting inundated with, are you the son of Leopold Tiermont? And this was very powerful. This really brought it home for me, his iconic legacy. I left Wall Street a couple years after, after uh, fighting uh, the, the markets, after American government intervention in the markets. I did not feel it was a hospitable place for my worldview. So I left and started to figure out what the next step was. And I ended up engaging my political passions more directly, and I joined a think tank, a, a burgeoning NGO called American Transparency which mission was to put all American public sector spending online to crowdsource and forensically audit the waste, fraud, malfeasance, and abuse that comes from public sector spending, generally by default. Uh, it's a very ambitious project. It is ongoing. Uh, it is a passion, and it is, I think, a necessary project and a game changer, and one that I hope, with the model that we build, is exported all over the world. I've had conversations with other other think tanks in other countries, including Ukraine, including Australia. Uh, I've tried to initiate these discussions in Poland. So far, there are no takers, not surprisingly, on putting all public sector spending online. We will get into why shortly. Uh, 
with this uh, sort of career jump and this building of sort of uh, political advocacy, I call it uh, issue-based advocacy, uh, good governance, uh, honest governance, transparent governance, accountable government, uh, I became more and more skeptical, I innately was, uh, of government in the way that it acts in our best interests, or so it, they say, ostensibly. And when I started coming to Poland, I started analyzing the political situation in Poland because I'm a very political animal, obviously. And in 2010, there was a snap election. Again, the first time I was in Poland was one week before Smolensk. And for two years, I came to Poland, and I just went around Poland. I got to know people, uh, a lot of conversations with young people, mostly. And I really fell in love with the history, the culture, and more than anything, the attitude, the attitude of optimism among the youth. Every single young person I spoke to without fail when I asked them, and again, very incognito, just an American tourist, what do you want to do? And it was all driven toward entrepreneurialism. And after years of visiting France and Spain, that was a stark oppositional answer uh, to, say, a French 22-year-old who would like to get a government job with five to six weeks of vacation a year, retire 20 years with a big pension. In Poland, there was an entrepreneurialism that I really fell in love with. And the more I engaged it, the more I really started to understand why the pieces uh, came together that way. And uh, my own feeling is it's, it's hundreds of years of imperial oppression has driven Poles by necessity to be more entrepreneurial, to survive. Uh, even the language, though I do not yet speak it, and it will be the challenge of my life, uh, it's very daunting. I noticed the nuance in the language, and that was after hundreds of years of oppression, uh, whether it was Germans, Prussians, Soviets, Russians, <coughs> Tsarist Russia, Austria, Hungary. And after two years, I was invited to Darłowo, a small town on the Baltic coast, where my father set one of his uh, novels, sort of an uh, under, under followed novel, uh, Seven Long Voyages. Uh, and I spoke at a ribbon cutting for a square named after him, and I spoke to a journalist who was there, and we decided to write a book. Uh, about my experiences, about coming to Poland, my impressions, and uh, getting to know my father through his literature because I did not know him. My memories of him were very, very sparse. In fact, every when we did the book tour, every interview was, what do you remember about your father? And it was always two real anecdotes that I had somewhat tangibly in my memory bank. Uh, one was he yelled at my sister and I a lot, and a twin sister, uh, any time we were playing when the evening news was going on. He was very driven to understand what was going on in Central and Eastern Europe specifically. And the only place in 1982, 83, 84 you could get that, uh, if you didn't want to wait for the next day's newspaper, was the nightly news. So I remember getting yelled at a lot. Uh, the other memory, which is very poignant and very powerful, I think all polls will appreciate, is every week he would take either my sister or I grocery shopping with him. And watching him choose the 20 types of orange juice on the shelves, was you could sense the emotion he had having that choice. So that informed me, and it was later on when I used to hear the jokes and the anecdotes about the only thing that Polish sleps had was vinegar in abundance. Uh, it, it was made even more richly contextualized. Uh, so this was also very influential to me in formative years of understanding markets and choice and what freedom in the ability to create gives uh, all of us in the ability to transact. So in 2013, when I did this book tour, I only had two memories to, uh, to uh, elucidate for the interviewing, the interlocutors and the audience. So it always gravitated to economics and politics, which is what I know and what I'm passionate about. Of course, not the publisher kept saying, don't talk about politics. So of course, I kept talking about politics. Uh, from there, I ended up writing a column for Super Express. Super Express is the number two uh, newspaper in Poland by, uh, by daily print run, uh, the number one being fact. Number one and number two are both tabloids. There's something poetic in that. Uh, and Super Express was the largest Polish-owned newspaper because fact is owned by Axel Springer, a German company. And in the writing in Super Express, I think the visibility of me and what I was saying rose pretty quickly because I was saying a lot of things that most people wouldn't say. <coughs> And that was the beginning of my education in engaging the Polish political debate. And I wrote things that most people would not say because they were very direct. And this was also coming from a framework 
of economically free market and naturally distrustful of the political class, those who tell us what to do. And in doing so, uh, it became a little bit like a drug to me to put out these hyperbolic views, which I would 100% stand behind, uh, though they might, they especially seemed hyperbolic to the Polish debate at that time. Uh, I thought I was just saying what anybody had the right to say. I believe that the political class needs to be criticized, needs to be held accountable through public debate, and they need to defend their position every single day from every allegation of corruption and malfeasance and their decision making that is done again in our best interest. Uh, so combined with social media and starting to write more columns, uh, I got very deeply engaged. Uh, and the sort of sea change moment for me was when I wrote an article for Forbes uh, in the US uh, entitled Poland's Coming Recession. And this was about, and not to get too in the weeds on the economics, the prediction that Poland was gonna go into recession and that it didn't have to be this way. Poland had the animal spirits and the natural growth coming online that could have driven economic growth for a generation, for years and years and years, much like we've seen with China. So many people moving up the consumer food chain generates huge domestic economic growth. And I wrote that an inflection was coming and this catalyst was corruption. After, especially after the tape scandal of Feta Tashmova, which I think most people here know something about, but for those who don't, the Polish government officials of the last government, uh, mostly figures from Plataforma Opitelska, Civic Platform, were caught on tape in restaurants, scheming, backroom deals, making fun of the electorate, making fun of their relationships. Uh, some of the worst examples were Rostislav Sikorsky, who I will speak quite a lot about, uh, and Marek Belka, Rostislav Sikorsky, saying that, uh, that the American relationship is essentially worthless. He used slightly more colorful terminology, which I won't repeat. Uh, that alone was not something I fully disagreed with, uh, but it really showed you his character, and it was an eye-opener for a lot of people. Uh, the other one, and this I maintain, is the largest attempted criminal act in modern Polish history, was the head of the constitutionally mandated independent central bank, the National Bank of Poland, the head of the bank, Marek Belka, was caught on tape with an emissary of the last government, the interior minister, Bartholomew Sienkiewicz, planning to coordinate monetary policy in an effort to swing the upcoming election. This is a crime no matter how you slice it, uh, especially given the constitutional mandate of independence. Most developed economies, uh, most, uh, most countries that have reputable, uh, reputable, reputable economic systems uh, mandate this independence because if you don't have this independence, the ability to print money has huge impact on other externalities, including politics, obviously economics and consumption, uh, short-term GDP. Uh, so they were looking to potentially depreciate the currency and this is such a large-scale crime because this is tantamount to stealing from every single Pole and every single investor in Poland in Zloty-denominated assets. By reducing the value of this currency, they are skimming a little bit, just like in ancient Rome when they used to skim a little bit off the metal coinage. And that's what they were willing to do. And this was an incredible crime. I wrote about this in Forbes. And this got me summoned to the presidential palace by the uh, then President Bronisław Komorowski's head of chancellery, Paweł Lasiewicz. As you can see, I like to name names. Mm -hmm. I believe that truth is a absolute defense. Uh, and he summoned me, and it's funny because he actually had some Washington DC experience as a, uh, as a Cato scholar or some sort of internship he did. And so he was supposed to be somebody they thought that I could connect with. Uh, and I was loosely threatened. Things like, you can't write that kind of stuff here. You're gonna have huge problems in this country. And I said, watch me. I will write what I want to write. Uh, and then he tried to take a different tack. Well, what you write is not true, it's totally false. Well, I was a macro uh, portfolio manager with a heavy, heavy dose of macroeconomic analysis uh, and global uh, economic trends on Wall Street for over a decade uh, with the University of Chicago background and a lot of economics work. And I said, let's go point by point. Please feel free to refute, I'm happy to debate. He said, I will not do that with you. So that was also a bit of a, uh, an eye -opener. Uh, so this was kind of the milieu that I was now dealing with, uh, engaging the political debate as a journalist. And I, I do like to say that I make a distinction. I am not as much a journalist as I am an editorialist. There's a difference. Uh, the problem is when journalists call themselves journalists and they're editorialists. Uh, Henry Foy of the FT is a great example. Uh, he curates fact patterns, 
to push an agenda. Uh, that is not journalism, that's editorialism. I proudly exclaim, I am an editorialist. I give opinions on the current situation. Of course, there is a heavy dose of journalism and research and fact. I, I believe that when I put out a piece, whether it's for Breitbart London, and I do want to say my editor is here, Raheem Kassam, who's an absolute mensch, to borrow a Yiddish term. Uh, he, uh, when, I, when I put something out, I believe that I am right, and I believe that I have a job to do to convince people that I'm right, and the only way I can honestly do that is by putting forward a full, pack, a full fact pattern. And this is where him and I have issues because my pieces generally go 2,500 to 3,500 words, which is a little in excess of the modern uh, reader's uh, attention span. So I got very engaged in this last, uh, last government criticizing them. The real moment where my engagement became visible to a critical mass of people was when I wrote innocuously on my Facebook page, after the Prost, the, the news weekly that aired a Fedotash Mova, the tape scandal, aired the transcript. <coughs> and just to note, every single media outlet in Poland had access to these transcripts. And they all declined to print them because most of them were in bed with the government, either politically and socially, or more, uh, more perniciously economically, including the paper of record, uh, Gazette of Aborcha, which I will talk more about later. Uh, so the Prost I looked upon as a, as a positive player in the media universe, and the irony is that the Prost, uh, was the most famous editor-in-chief was a guy named Stefan Kishilevsky. He was a, uh, uh, an intellectual and a artist and a literati and a political critic during the PRL, during Congress and Times, and he was the editor-in-chief of a post in the 80s. And he was also my father's best friend. My father had a trifecta. Uh, they were this little trifecta of literati friends. It was Stefan Kishilevsky, it was my father, and it was the great poet, Zbigniew Herbert. And so seeing the post air, the, air the, the transcripts of these tapes and continue to con punch the government, and really to their economic detriment, the government went after the owner, a uh, guy who I now am proud to call a friend and a brother in arms, Mikhail Lushetsky, uh, a self-made guy uh, who made the decision, it came to him to make the decision to air, these, to air the transcripts of these tapes, and they went after him hard. They sued him, they canceled all advertising contracts, the biggest advertisers in Poland still, unfortunately, are state-owned enterprises. Uh, a too large portion of the economy is still state-owned industry. Uh, oil companies uh, like Orlin and Lotos, uh, the train, uh, really, in my view, the, the worst example is the state-owned insurance company, uh, PZU, uh, which also has an investment fund, insurance companies print money. It's just automatic cash flow every quarter, so that cash flow went into an investment fund. And what did that company invest in? Gazette of Aborcha. So Gazette of Aborcha, the daily paper of record uh, since 1989-1990, uh, was working very hard to cover up all scandal. And you start to see as I talk about these things, all these things are connected. So going back to this one watershed moment, uh, the Post wrote an article about Radoslav Sikorsky paying Charles Crawford, a, the former UK ambassador to Poland, about 400,000 zloty to proofread each of 20 speeches. So it's 19 speeches uh, at uh, about 20,000 per. And I just wrote that, th and coming from my background at this point of doing forensic auditing of government spending, uh, there was no competitive bidding. Uh, there was no real disclosures behind it. This came out years later. And I said, this is what fraud looks like. And this was on, Jan this was on Sunday night. This is when the issue came out on January second or third, right after New Year's. And I woke up to Monday, the top story on ONET, it was right after New Year's, it was a holiday, it was a very light news day, I assume. Top story, Terramon calls Sikorsky fraud. And Twitter, Facebook blowing up, and tweets from a guy named Roman Gertig. Roman Gertig is a lawyer, he was the former education minister, he was a deputy prime minister, uh, he'd been jumping between parties, and most recently he'd been affiliated with platform Obatelska, and he was a mercenary lawyer for those in the government to go after those who criticized those in the government. So I woke up to a tweet from Roman Gertig saying, this act of hate speech will not stand, Tehran can expect papers from us soon. So 
That really energized me. That, you know, the irony of a education minister going around suing people for expressing themselves and writing, and of course this was ridiculous. It was an act of bluster because I wrote this on Facebook uh, to my select group uh, of friends and followers, which at that point was rather meager. Uh, and I wrote this from the uh, safety and confines of my New York apartment. Uh, so jurisdictionally, this would have been problematic for a, a, a real litigation. But I noticed that there was a whole level of their supporters saying, go after them, you know, cut them off at the knees, and this kind of rhetoric that free speech and criticism of politicians would not stand. Now, I think uh, people can see already, and if you read me, you can see if somebody tells me not to do something, I do it loudly, hard, aggressively. Uh, like your reason. father. Correct. Like my father. I like to think I'm a little bit more diplomatic, and I can have a drink with anyone, including you know many fig figures in the opposition. Uh, he was a little bit more caustic, but his times were a little bit more caustic, and he was starving. I mean, he, they starved him out. My father, an interesting story is that he couldn't even wait tables. Uh, there was an SPEC following him every time he walked into a restaurant to get a job as a waiter. The SPEC would follow him right in after and say, you cannot hire him. So it was only through the kindness of his friends like Kieschel, Stefan Kieschelewski, and Herbert, and his wife, Barbara Ha, that he was able to survive. Uh, and that was, ironically, and he wrote about this quite a lot as well, he wrote about this in books like Jishi Chove, Jishi Chove, which really uh, uh, described the zeitgeist of the political class at the time. And they were very successful in stifling him. Uh, I am coming from a different perspective, having been U.S. educated, certainly having his aggressive bloodline, uh, and also being financially independent after several years on Wall Street. And so I was ready for a lawsuit, because my view was Poland needs to have a landmark free speech case on what constitutes defamation. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I believe truth is the absolute defense. This is not something I made up. This was the rallying cry in 1739 colonial Boston of a newspaper editor, John Peter Zenger, a German immigrant, who wrote about the provincial mayor who was stealing a portion of the excise taxes, and they tried to cut him off at the knees, and they tried to, he had an anonymous reporter slash contributor who wrote about this, and they tried to bury him, they tried to put him out of business, they tried to sue him for damages, and he ended up with this landmark case delineating what defamation really means. And if you're speaking the truth, it's not defamatory. In America, the burden of proof of defamation is saying something you know to be false with the intent to damage reputationally and financially. In Poland, and again, Poland's legal code has morphed from a PRL, communist, post-communist code. It is not the greatest codification of Republican and post-enlightened ideals. In Poland, defamation is constituted by criticism of a public official. And this even includes teachers. Teachers are considered public officials, and if you, publish a, if you publicly criticize a teacher vocally, you could be called into court. Uh, one of the things I like from the new government is they are pluralists. I see when Bronisław Komorowski, uh, there was uh, websites criticizing him, uh, Secret Service and Internal Security came in and arrested people and brought them to prison and took down the websites. When there was criticism of Andrzej Duda after the election, uh, local prosecutors, uh, cultured in the same dynamic, tried to do the same thing, and Andrzej Duda stood up and said, no, let them criticize me. And it tells you uh, a, a bit about who these people are and who their predecessors are. So that's kind of a long-winded introduction to my background and to my engagement.